All right, guys, let's get into some brake lines here. I ordered uh, a few things, well, over <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I apologize right out of the hop here. I've forgotten where I've ordered this stuff from. I believe the brake line and the fittings came from Eastwood. This came from, I think I got it off of Amazon, uh, but it's stainless steel brake line armor. I know for a fact that the flaring tool came from, from Eastwood, but none of it was hard to find and none of it was horribly expensive. Uh, the brake line is, is copper nickel. I've never used it before. Uh, the original steel zinc coated stuff from, from the factory lasted a long time, but did show quite a bit of corrosion. Stainless steel is out there. It's available and guys that are doing a lot of rock crawling and, and uh, really heavy duty stuff probably want to do it in stainless steel, but you know, light duty stuff or mild four by four action. I think this, this copper nickel is probably the best way to go. It's really corrosion resistant, easy to work with, easy to flare, reasonably priced. Uh, I think it's uh, going to be a good fit for us. Uh, I've never done any double flaring before. Uh, a lot of single flare, single, uh, yeah, single flare in the uh, aviation world but never double flare. So I uh, bought the tool from Eastwood. As you can see, I've, I've cheated already. Well, there you go. Now you can see I've cheated already. I've already did one flare. I couldn't wait, had to see how the tool worked and it worked great. So it makes it really easy. The, the tool was fairly pricey. I think 150 bucks. I, I believe I bought it on sale for around 150. Uh, but it's a you know it's a complicated tool. It's not real easy to produce. You got uh, you know four different dies, and uh, the mechanism itself is is uh, pretty complicated. So uh, all in all, I think it's a good value. It certainly worked well on this on this flare, and uh, we'll see more of that coming down the road. Um, flex lines. Uh, this is the replacement for the uh, for the back one. It's uh, rough country exact same length as the original and I really want it to be longer than this um, you know it's got a six inch lift this is for the uh, the standard suspension uh, needs to be longer but having a difficult time finding a longer one now I've changed the location of where it connects to the frame and I picked up a couple of inches probably three inches or so just by changing the position so I feel like this has got enough slack in it to do the job, but still would rather see it, uh, you know, maybe three or four inches longer. It'd be nice to have a good, good kink in it, um, so the suspension has plenty of travel without <laughs> without snatching the brake line loose. All right, so uh, let's get started. I'm gonna kind of take a measurement, a rough measurement of how much line I'm gonna need. Figure out a good way of cutting this. Whether I need to use a uh, tubing cutter or uh, or what I guess uh, I guess that's the direction I'm, I feel like I need to go as a tubing cutter and then we'll uh, we'll work on some bends and um, and then uh, do some flaring all right guys one way I picked up a couple inches of uh, distance on that on this flex tube was this bracket used to be straight and uh, this junction block I believe laid in there uh, like that bolted to the bracket when it was coming straight out here and and then the hard lines went from here to the left wheel and then that direction to the right wheel well I, I put this 90 extra 90 degree bend in here so I could turn this block this direction which moves the flex part of it up you know, I don't, I don't know, it gives you two or three inches extra. So uh, that's how I'm making up some of the, the slack here or giving it some extra slack. I also changed the position of the other end of where that bracket goes or the other end of the flex line uh, tab goes in here. It used to, um, can't remember how it was connected before, sorry, but uh, I believe it, it hung yeah, it hung down off of the uh, top leg of the frame and uh, the flex line came in and went in this direction 
and then the hard line connected to it and bent inside the, the frame here and traveled towards the front that way. So uh, we're going to gain, I'm going to say we're going to gain an extra at least four inches uh, from the, uh, <laughs> the standard arrangement, which is, is better, but like I said, this is a six inch lift, so I think I'd like to have another couple inches added to it. Hmm, oh, look at the shape of that hole. Look at the shape of the old line. Look at the shape of the new line. Ugh, rough country. You know, and a smart guy would have figured all that out before he welded that tab back to the frame because it sure would have been easier to use a file on that tab in a vise versus welded to the frame. But uh, here I go. All right, well that <laughs> looks a little better. Oh, and you ever you turn this camera on and look up close, it doesn't look as good as it does in real life. Uh, either that or my eyes are just getting that old. All right, so the other problem we had here is I, uh, I apparently have put the uh, special clip it slides onto this thing in a uh, in a special place that I would not lose it. But that special place is not um, readily available, I guess. I will probably find it later, or hey, maybe I won't. Let's see if I can monkey this thing up. With this E clip here. Oh, look at that. Well, you know what? There we go. That looks a little better. All right. Not, uh, not perfect. I'll keep my eye open for the little, I think it's one of those uh, little slider ones that slide on there with the, the tab on it. I'm guessing. It was uh, quite some time ago when this got taken apart. And you know, the re reality of it is I, <laughs> I may not have ever taken it apart. These lines didn't fit uh, when I got the truck. And, uh, oh, you know, I just uh, thought crossed my mind as I was speaking that uh, some of this stuff was hanging on the old line. And I'm looking, looking, looking. Yeah, I don't see it, so. I'll keep my eyes open for it if it's there. If we find it, I'll replace it. If not, I think that E-clip will be just fine. I think I'm going to use the old brake line here for a pattern. Uh, it still fits fairly well. I'm a little bit short where I diked it off there next to the uh, the brake, uh, the wheel cylinder there. And uh, it's a little bit short just because I repositioned that T-block. Um, I've, I've manipulated this. To, to get it a little bit closer, but still probably about a half inch short there. So um, I think it's going to make a great pattern. <laughs> All right, let's see. Uh, uh, wrong box. Let's see if we can find the old even cutter here. Oh, yeah. There. Maybe that one will do the job. Mm-hmm. Hey, you know, I had a guy uh, put a comment on my uh, my one of my videos about he he told me to wear some gloves because he didn't like to see my nicked up hands and uh, I, you know I agree with him I guess when I'm watching these videos and somebody's hands are all scuffed up like mine tend to get um, yeah I, I guess it kind of creeps me out too but uh, you know, I'm out here making these videos and building this truck for my son. Um, for my enjoyment as well. 
but it's not always convenient to put gloves on and uh, I guess if you're that offended by my uh, my hard working hands then uh, you know move on down the road so uh, apologize for uh, for being bloodied up here but uh, that's the way it goes all right I'm gonna lob off a piece here and uh, just start working it from there and sometimes the best way to do it is just to, or best way to learn is just to jump in and uh, figure it out as you go probably gonna be a little bit extra length here but stuff's not horribly expensive I already picked out the uh, the proper fittings. Uh, went over and double checked those to make sure that they fit in the wheel cylinder and the uh, the T block there, and they did. I think that's probably going to be the most common ones used uh, for the brake lines here. You know, there's some of these uh, video channels, these YouTube channels that these guys are just amazing at not only the work that they do, but the uh, the editing and the, the production of the video. And uh, I get a little envious about that sometimes when I'm sitting around enjoying their fruit and wish I could, <laughs> there we go, wish I could do a little better, but... You know, I'm not, I'm not in it for the cash here. I'm just in it for, uh, for the learning experience and, uh, you know, kind of, uh, I guess, uh, more or less recording it, uh, for my boy. All right, let's see. We got the right length piece here. Um, I think, let's see, this was the end that was, uh, yeah, wheel cylinder. So it needs to be uh, about an inch longer. I'm going to go ahead and sl slide on the nut so we don't forget about it. Oh boy. Oh, there it goes. All right. Once it popped on there, it slid on there pretty good. Oops. There you go. All right. Now I'm going to try to work this uh, to be about the same shape. And uh, we'll see whether I got to use my... Uh, my tubing bender here, whoops, or whether I'm going to need to get a different type of tubing bender. Boy, that's got to be frustrating to watch. About as frustrating as I am. Uh, trying to bend it. All right, that's uh, probably a wee bit too much. Straighten it. it. Does feel like it may work harden a little bit once you bend it. A little bit harder to bend to straighten back out. All right, that looks pretty good. Oh boy. I'm hoping I'll be able to bend this and then get the uh, the armor on it after I bend it. I can see this is going to get old in a hurry. Oh my goodness. Shouldn't be that difficult, should it? Mm. 
Maybe I gotta get a sharpie and start marking this where the bends are gonna be need to be. Dang, damn it. All right, we're getting there. I can see that part of this dilemma is just going to be, uh, let's see, keeping you guys in frame here. Going to add a lot to the aggravation. So I'm not going to do all of this on film because uh, I'm not going to record all this is probably what I should say. Because it would be just... Clean, aggravating. Oh. Huh. Boy, I don't think I'm going to be any too long, am I? Gotta be an easier way to remember this. All right, I'm pulling down. So, uh, there we go. Now you guys think it's aggravating to watch it? You gotta be doing it. All right, let's see if we're close on that. Got some stuff to straighten out here for sure don't like the shape of it but yeah i think we're close um a little bit short here and hopefully i can make that stretch or straighten out some of these bends these kinks and uh, make it make it fit so let me work it a little bit and then we'll take a look at it well <laughs> first attempt looks pretty good just short. Uh, all right, uh, round two. All right, uh, new new day, <laughs> fresh eyes, and uh, took another swing at this line. Uh, got it a little bit longer, obviously, but what I don't like about it is this big loop up here. It is just like the factory. Uh, line but I, I think what I'm going to do is we'll we'll flare the ends on it now and uh, then I'm going to probably reshape this to contour a little bit better um, this just looks like it's hanging up there in the breeze uh, easy for a rock or a stick or something to, to take it out so I'm going to try to uh, make it contour the tube a little better in the in the rear end or the pumpkin area but the rest of it looks pretty good. I'll probably straighten the, you know, some of the little wibble wobbles out of it um, as needed. But uh, let's go over there and, and try to do some flaring. All right, the first thing the instructions tell you to do is, is to square the end of the tubing. And it, it tells you to use a, a tubing cutter or a suitable tubing cutter. And then uh, to chamfer uh, basically deburr the, the inside and the outside of the cut. So I'm going to use my file, just a, the flat file, to, to file um, the end of it flat and then a, a small jeweler's round file to kind of clean up the inside. And then it also recommends that you clean the outside of the tubing 
um, so it'll fit in the die right. So uh, let's give that a whirl. All right, looks pretty good, nice and square. I think all the burr is off the inside of it. Let's see. Yeah, maybe a little bit more. Probably not really that critical, but we're playing around here, so let's see what we can what we need to do, what we have to do. Okay. Um, then it tells you that you need to make sure all the, you know, the swore for the, uh, the metal is out of it, so I'll blow it out. All right, now we're, uh, we're getting into uh, operating the, the heavy machinery here. <laughs> and it says, uh, after we've got the... Uh, tubing prepared, place the one and a half by one and a half square offset base of tool opposite the clamp into a secure vise. See figure one. Well, you know, I don't know who writes these things and whether they're, you know, I'm sure this thing's built in China, unfortunately, and maybe things are lost in the translation, but come on, can't you just write, you know, Clamp the tool in the vise. Uh, place rotating die head onto one and a quarter inch round boss adjacent to lever base. Well, they're telling you to, to put this thing on. It, it was already assembled when we got it. So, step two, garbage. Step three, place 11 inch foam gripped handle into hole at lever base. You know what? Install the handle? What is, do the lawyers get involved in this stuff? Pull clamp pin with black knob to release clamp. Oh, jeez, oh, Pete. Okay, rotate clamp upward. Now we're getting to the knit and grit. Um, choose the split die size that you need. Insert the dies into the rectangular recess in the tool base with a beveled counter bore end with size stamped towards the rotating die head and back end firmly against the step. All right, well, here's where we not run into another uh, bit of rub here. This is 3 16 tubing that we're dealing with, so I grabbed the 3 16 die. It's clearly, clearly stamped 3 16 but the instructions tell us, choose the split die that you need. Insert the dies into the rectangular recess in the tool base with the beveled contour end with size stamped towards the rotating die head and back end firmly against the steps. Well, I think you can see that it says 3 16 there. And if you flip it over, hmm says 3 16 there as well but it tells us remember it says okay choose the split die size that you need insert the dies into the rectangular recess in the tool base with the beveled contoured end in parentheses here with size stamped towards the rotating die head and the back end firmly against the step. Well, both ends are clearly stamped with the size. If I grab another one of these dies, this is the one for the three eighths. And you can see, I mean, we can use some common sense here as well. You see the three eighths stamped and it's got the beveled side of it. The opposite end is not stamped. Now there's four dies that come with this set. 
And I believe the 3 8 is the only one. Here's this is the quarter inch. That's the beveled side. That's the non beveled side, but stamped on both ends. Here's the 5 16 um, well, Let me flip them around here so they're even. There's the beveled side and non beveled side, clearly stamped on both sides. So um, I just now noticed it says DIN here. I'm not sure what that means. Maybe that's a clue. But, you know, common sense would tell us that, you know, we can look. We're all smart enough to figure out which side's the beveled side. There's the beveled side. And this side is not beveled. So we're going to put the beveled side towards the tool. And let's see, have to look at some pictures here. Goes that way. I'm going to start with this long end. I'm going to manipulate. Oh, yeah, we need to back up a step. It says uh, uh, somewhere in here uh, after the installing the oh let me go back here to the the setup the preparation here it says uh, lightly lubricate the end of uh, of the cut tubing with anti-seize and place appropriate fitting over the end of the tubing with the flare end facing outward all right that's an important step don't forget the nut um, if you forget the nut well, you guys know he'll be doing it over again. Not that I've ever, ever done that. Let's see, a little bit of anti seize. Oh, let's see, it just says a little dab will do you. So there it is. All right, so nuts on, anti-seize, dies in the proper orientation. And let's see, it says to choose the split die you need. We did that. Uh, beveled contour counterbore end with size stamped towards the rotating die head. And back end firmly against the step. That's right here. Place the tube between the die halves with the tube and flush with the die end of the die. All right, so I think what we need to do is we need to turn this to OP0. So that is OP0 clearly right there. And then I think we mash this. Get this, get this holding it closed. I think we're going to set the depth, push, push this down until this OP0 bumps up against the die, slide the tube in, and then tighten the clamp. That's going to set the depth. That's a pretty neat feature. Um, nice, and nice and tight there. All right, so now we're looking at the end. And it's it's nice and flush there. Let me uh, I'm gonna swing the camera around so we can see the business end of this thing. All right, the uh, the lighting in our uh, high tech studio here is brought to you by the uh, the good Lord. I don't have any blinds in my shop, so uh, you're just gonna have to deal with it. We're just going back through the uh, the instructions here, and and uh, we have done everything right. Brought the OP one. OP0 die up to or press whatever you call this thing this anvil is brought up to the die and uh, the brake line is slid in until it touches ensuring that we we have it flush with the end of the die and then tighten the clamp down they go into uh, all kinds of gyrations to uh, to tell you how to put this pin in the hole but you know pretty obvious 
flip it over, put the pin in the hole, tighten the clamp down. All right, I guess I shouldn't pick on people. It's probably more difficult to uh, to write instructions than uh, than I think it should be. All right, um, next thing to do is we switch over to the appropriate die here to uh, to make the flare. I think we're going to have to flare out the pipe first and then curl it back in. So to do that, we need to look at the 3 sixteenths. And I guess this OP, maybe if I read this thing thoroughly, would tell us exactly what OP means, but I would guess operation zero, <laughs> operation one, operation two, and operation, well, there's just two. So you'd think they'd go one, two, three, but anyways, I didn't design it. OP1, 3 sixteenths, and let's just kind of use some common sense here. Um, hmm. Yeah, I, I guess it's going to, oh, you know what it's going to do? I think it's going to, it's going to do this first. It's going to kind of scrunch it. You can also use this tool to make beaded ends on the end of your tubing. So that's, if you just wanted a beaded end, you know, to, to like slip a rubber hose over the end of it and a clamp, then you would probably just use this OP1 first part of it. And then we'll finish the flare out. Yeah, finish the flare out. Oh boy, my big, uh, my big beat up mitts there. Kind of squeeze it back in. We'll see. Um, all right, so yeah, yes, it definitely says... Uh, OP1 with appropriate size, OP1 3 16 move the lever against the tool body exerting sufficient effort to create flare. Alright, so here we go. It takes quite a bit of force. Uh, let's see if I can get you down there to take a look. All right, so that's it. It made a little bit of a, uh, a bulb on the end of the line. And uh, now we got to switch dies again and then push the inner part of that uh, bulb inside of itself. And indeed, the uh, instructions say if you stop here, you've created uh, what they call a bubble flare. Um, to, and then it says to continue or to create the 45 degree double flare, we'll switch to uh, OP. Uh, two and it's three sixteenths. Looks like this one doubles up to be uh, three sixteenths and a quarter inch. So OP two, and then we're just going to swing the lever again. Well, and I'm going to bump the mic. There we go. Swing the lever again, and um, again takes. Now I understand why the handle's so long creates uh, or it takes quite a bit of force to uh, to create that the flare so let's take a look and then it says uh, you know loosen the clamp take it out of the die and it says uh, step 16 you now have a finished pro quality 45 degree double flare let's take a look huh I wonder why it doesn't give us instructions on how to take it loose <laughs> oh boy. And I see he's on it there. Mm, where are you? There you are. Hmm. Pretty nice. You know, I, I don't, for the life of me, understand uh, why we use double flares on uh, on brake lines, on automotive stuff. Um, like I said, you know, I, I come from the aviation world, and uh, the hydraulic pressures on most uh, large aircraft run at uh, 3,000 PSI with aluminum tubing and... Uh, 
they're all single flared aluminum tubing, AN fittings. So I'm not sure, do maybe somebody else out there knows what kind of pressures you can develop in the brake lines of a of an automotive, you know, application. And maybe you just need the extra strength. Maybe you can create um, yeah, maybe more than 3,000 PSI. And maybe that's the reason why we need the double flare. Is it really that much stronger? Um, must be, because you certainly see a lot of a lot of information about not using single flare stuff on on brake lines. So, again, I uh, hey, apologize for the uh, the busted up knuckle, but uh, hey, that's life out here. All right, so. Um, what are we going to do? I think I'm going to try to reshape uh, this, this end of it here a little bit before I slide the, uh, the spiral stainless over the top of it and then flare the other end. Um, might be able to, to wiggle that stainless on there uh, without... Um, might be able to spiral it on there. I don't think I'd want to try that, but... Um, let me rework this uh, this line a little bit, and we'll we'll see what we got to do. All right, I, I tightened it up a little bit. It's still uh, it, it's it's hard to make this bend real tight, and I, I don't think you really want it really close to the to the nut. So it's still hanging out in the breeze a little bit, but uh, not too bad. So we're gonna install this. Uh, what do they call it? They call it uh, armor. And uh, already opened up one. And I think you can just. I wonder if we need to. Let's see. Well, it looks like they just diked it off. It's not real sharp. I was just wondering if they whiz wheeled it off and made a, you know, real sharp end on it. But it doesn't appear like they have. So just thread it on here and uh, then I'll probably have to mark it like putting a slinky on a, on a piece of tubing oops oh boy Bent my tube. All right, let's see. I don't think we want to go all the way to the nut. Got to have some room for the nut to to move around. Kind of difficult working around the camera there. Yeah, boy, you get uh, too much of this on there, and it really kind of gets difficult to to slide on there. Oh, it was those uh, Chinese party favor things that you'd stick your fingers in and couldn't get your fingers out of. Okay, that's probably close enough. Let me look at the factory one. It was right here. Um, yeah, about the same. So, uh, let's look at here. They're hanging over. We're about, what, eight inches too long there. Plus, if we looked at the uh, the factory one, it was back off the nut, you know, two or three inches there. So let's mark it. Let's mark it right in here. And uh, pull it back off a little ways and see what it takes to cut that. You know what, I might just, might leave it a little bit longer than that because now that I'm pushing it back off of there, it's scrunching up quite a bit. So I think I'm gonna leave it, I'm gonna cut it a little bit longer and then try to, try to squish it all on there, see how that works. All right, so yeah, I just took it over to the whiz wheel and, uh, and whizzed it off. Or cut cut it off. Let's see. There it is. There's my jagged edge. I cut it off that way, and then on on this end of it, I just took the wheel and, and put it on a ninety degree, and cut a little 
piece of it off. Um, so I wouldn't have this jagged edge is what I'm trying to say is I, I tried to clean it up and not have a jagged edge there to, to cut my, you know, to cut my fingers on. So I left enough where we can put this thing back in the die and, uh, and flare this end. And of course we don't want to forget the nut. So I'm going to flare that one and we should be done with this one. All right, here's another uh, another snafu. Um, as I'm saying that, I'm just thinking about, I wonder why the back end of this die is, what is this back end of this die used for? The D-I-N, I gotta figure that out. Anyways, that's not what, uh, what I was getting at here, was look at, Oh, not long enough. So I guess uh, what we're going to do here, push this down. You have to straighten this back out carefully. Oh. All right, tapered or chamfered edge. Flop. Oh, my knuckle's in the way. All right. Nice and tight. And now flare. All right, there it is, finished product. It's in, and I uh, used a little anti-seize on the, uh, on the uh, threads there in the wheel cylinder as well as into the uh, t-block but uh, i think it looks looks good hey just a little recap on on this eastwood tool i like it so it works great with this copper nickel brake line i think it it makes a really nice flare and it's easy to use the instructions well yeah yeah, I guess they got to write instructions for all kinds of skill levels, and um, you know, it works. It uh, you can figure it out. Not not difficult at all. So, hey, thumbs up to Eastwood on on a great tool and uh, copper nickel brake line. Um, I'm a fan of that as well. It, it seems to be uh, easy to work, reasonably priced, and. Um, you know, it flares real well with, with this tool. And I don't think it's going to be any weaker than the original steel stuff. Um, it feels like it bends at about the same effort level. So it's got to be pretty close to, you know, tensile strength. It's got to be pretty close to the same, I would guess. Um, anyways, uh, I'm happy with, uh, with the tubing as well. I didn't say anything earlier about uh, fittings or or the different fittings that are available. You can buy these in stainless as well. And I thought a couple of times or thought a little bit about uh, buying stainless ones because they sure are frustrating when uh, when these things get locked into the wheel cylinders or any of the fittings. But you know, I don't think stainless is going to help that any. If you got a stainless nut going into a cast iron fitting you're going to have some electricity going on and uh, i think you're going to have just as bad of problems with stainless nuts as you would with these steel nuts my experience with stainless steel fittings they're soft they they make them out of a soft stainless and um, then when they get seized up you got to put some real muscle on them to get them out they just deform and it turns into a into a mess most of these lasted uh, a good long time with uh, with steel fittings, and uh, hey, if, <laughs> I think we'll get another thirty years out of out of what we're making there. So, steel fittings it is, copper nickel line just to make it easy to bend and easy to form, and uh, Eastwood flaring tool. 
thumbs up on all that stuff. So uh, I think that's it. I'm going to um, continue making brake lines, probably make them for the next uh, two or three days, and then uh, we'll move on to something else. All right, guys, uh, we've made a little progress on the lines here. Uh, ben and I had the opportunity to, to get out here and do a little bit of work on the truck, and that's what this project's all about. So I don't do a lot of filming. Yeah. I don't do a lot of recording. It's not filming, is it? Do do a lot of recording when he's home. I just try to be productive out here. We don't get a lot of opportunity to uh, to work on it together. So I uh, apologize for kind of uh, skipping through this, but um, that's just the way it is. So uh, we've got the uh, the fuel line. This is the main feed line, a uh, main uh, fuel line here. Um, the suction line, I guess you should call it, or we should call it, uh, to hook to the uh, the pickup tube here on the tank. And uh, we've got it started. It just really comes around here. I haven't bent it any farther, working on that now. And uh, the brake line goes all the way up to the front. And it's just kind of coiled up, waiting to be terminated up there as well. But we're trying to work out the process on how we're holding these lines together and we we kind of stopped I had to order some uh, 5 16 tubing it's the return line for the fuel uh, fuel tank it goes right right here that's 5 16 there it's smaller actually coming off the engine I think it's only about uh, maybe 3 16 coming off the engine, but it, it'll run into a 5 16 line all the way back here to, to the tank for the return. These uh, blocks here that we've made uh, to hold the line, um, actually, uh, let me grab one of those. All right, I picked these blocks up uh, when I was down at an air show or their aviation um, pieces, but you could really make them out of about anything. Um, this is just, I'm not even sure what it is, nylon or, or something. I bought, I think, about 10 of them, and we've cut them down right here for, for three holes. And um, they, they work pretty good. We had to open up uh, a couple of the, the holes bigger for the bigger size tubing. I was originally going to cut them out of micarta, but I saw these at the air show and decided this would probably be a little bit easier work than the micarta. So... That's what we're using. And the third hole in the center there is gonna be for the return line. This is getting kind of complicated where, where the tubing's bending around here and uh, how we're gonna support it in the center section. We're trying to keep this stuff as protected as we can as well. And I uh, may even build some kind of uh, cover plate to go over the stuff that's going along the frame rail. Since, um, you know, originally it was run inside the frame rail, which would give it a lot of protection. Uh, but since, uh, we box the frame we can't uh, can't put it inside the frame rail anymore so i made this bulb on the end the little tool that i made and i'm getting ready to do the return line the same way uh, with the 5 16 and i'll show you that process here uh, now all right hey that eastwood flaring tool has the ability to make this bulbed or beaded end on the end of the tubing but I, I tried one on the 3 16 and I just didn't, I didn't like the shape of it. Uh, this is what it turned out, oops, this is what it turned out to be, was uh, kind of this bulbous end right on the end. And I, I guess that'd be fine uh, if you're slipping the rubber over the end. It's probably good. It, it's got a nice little taper to it. I mean, there's no sharp edges, so it's not going to cut the inside of the rubber. That's probably good, and that's probably what I ought to do. <laughs> it's probably what I had to use since I already bought the tool for it and I don't have to make anything, but it's not what I'm used to. Uh, ah, it changes hard. Um, but anyways, <laughs> I'll think about this some more. But uh, these are the tools that I've made in the past to, uh, to be the ends of, well, aluminum tubing is what I normally do. And uh, I already had these, and I used this one on the fuel supply line, which was 3 8 and it was a little bit wobbly. This wasn't quite the right diameter, but it, it worked just fine. This one I use on, I think it's 5 8 tubing, and I made it 
years ago. Um, the ball's not in there right now because I don't I don't make any way to retain the balls in there. They just they sit in there. I use a little bit of grease to kind of hold them in while I'm using them. But you know, and of course there's and there's commercial versions of these out there, and uh, I don't know they're not horribly expensive. I don't think, but you know what the heck, you got the tools to make them. They're easy enough to make. Um, make them up as you go i guess that's been my uh my plan but this one i might try a little bit different um might you know this one i i had a i have a bunch of this uh hexagonal hex uh, hexagonal stock that i just turned down on the lathe to make it fit inside the tubing uh, a little bit too big on this one and then um, I drill the holes tap it and then put a little ball bearing in there uh, to make that bead but this one I used um, uh, just some round stock that I had that was the right size I welded a nut on the end ground it smooth uh, drilled it tapped it same deal this one's got a little uh, tapered pilot in there there it is. I actually used a spring. This one is probably the most sophisticated one that I've made. Um, a little spring in there that, that pushes this tapered um, pilot back. That's what pushes up on the ball. But it doesn't have to be that complicated. This one, let me see. Uh, this is the right Allen wrench. Ah, stand by. I'm not sure why that Allen screw is so tight in there, but no, just rust, I guess. I put a little bit of NICs back on that before I stick it together. But so I just uh, used an Allen screw. It's probably metric, and uh, put a little taper on it, and it's what what pushes the ball up out of the hole there. So I'll, I'll show you how we use this. It's probably uh, pretty self-explanatory to most people, but. Uh, let's make one for this uh, 5 16 line, the return line, and I think I'm going to try to do it out of this bolt. It's uh, just a, I don't know, maybe somebody knows what AHB means, but I think it's just a, a grade 4 bolt, pretty cheap hardware bolt. Obviously, the softer, the better, at least easier to work. It won't quite fit inside the tubing right now so I'll turn this down on the lathe a little bit true it up a little bit and then uh, drill the hole in the center I'll probably drill the hole in the center first maybe not maybe I'll true it up first drill the hole in the center and then go from there so uh, off to the lathe now get some work done all right we're set up over here on the lathe and I've already done a little bit of work here I just used a whiz wheel and cut the end of that bolt off and then I chucked it up in the lathe and faced the edge of that bolt just to uh, to get rid of that uh, well to, to make a good starting point to uh, to drill the hole a nice flat surface is what I'm trying to say so I, I used a starter bit and now I've got the right drill bit set up in the chuck and I'm gonna use this well, I got a new one over there. This is the one out of the other beading tool that I, I just replaced the screw in it because it was uh, kind of rusted up. So I'm going to use the same Allen screw. I thought I had another one over here. Ooh, I've got the tap here ready to go for it. You know what? Let me double check. I think that's an 832. Let me double check that. That is indeed an 832. So I've got the right drill bit in here, uh, number 29. I'm gonna probably drill this one all the way through um, just so I can tap it all the way through. All right, here we go. <laughs> We're not gonna power tap this, especially with such a teeny tiny a tap here. And I can tell you this tap seen some action too, so. take it out of the chuck here finish it up over at the workbench all right well you guys know how this process works so i'm going to run this in and uh, then we'll get to the next step 
but take your time and uh, lots of cutting oil. This, uh, this is pretty easy to do. All right, we're, uh, we're threaded and now we just need to turn down the shank just a wee bit to make it slide into uh, the tubing. And uh, this, is, <laughs> this is a little bit dicey here, but I'm just gonna lightly tighten this in the chuck and the, uh, you know, the difficult part is you're just not, there's not any really good way to hold this, but we definitely need to try to center it. So I'm going to use the uh, live tailstock just to kind of help me center it and uh, position it. And then I'm going to tighten the heck out of this. All right. Now I should be able to back this out and it should run fairly true. All right. The inside of that tubing mics out somewhere around about a 270. Uh, 0.270 and uh, this is uh, miking out. I guess it's supposed to be a 5 16 bolt. Well kind of loose tolerance is there but about 305 So uh, what is that? Uh, 35 about 35 thousandths. We have to take off from it a little more than I thought it was but Let's get to work here. I'm not gonna get done till we start cutting metal So we're gonna take like I said some pretty light cuts on it uh, shoot, let me get the cutting oil. I'm going to start off taking about uh, 5,000 set of pass. I got the dial indicator set up and uh, zeroed out. Yeah, she were a little out of true that, there, but we'll clean that up. All right, I'm going to dial up uh, about 5,000. All right, so that we weren't too far out of true because that cleaned it up. So let's see what it's indicating now. 293. I'll take another five thousandths, which is actually ten thousandths because it's five thousandths per side. All right, so theoretically we should be at 283. All right, 282, that's close enough, huh? All right, we need to be at 270. It was running about 268 is what it was showing. So I'm gonna try to hit 270, see what happens. So I'm gonna take six thousandths. That's six thousandths aside, 12 thousandths total. That should bring us right down to 270. All right, well, let's see how we did. Oh, yeah, I think we can live with that. All right, I'm going to put a chamfer on this edge. All right, let's see if it uh, fits in the pipe. Let's see if I can get it in there. Oh, I think that'll work. All right, now we got to determine where we want the side hole to be. And it really just an eyeball. Uh, I'm going to put it, you know, you know, what is that one about? quarter inch off the end, three sixteenths off the end, so uh, right in there. And then, now we also need to to find a ball bearing or grab a ball bearing so we know what size to drill the hole. Uh, I've already tapered the end of the bolts, our 832 screw, and I just <laughs> I rednecked it in the uh, drill and hit it with the grinder and put a taper on it so let's see how that fits in there so now uh, let's find a ball bearing all right tucked away in the secret drawer here is uh, lots of ball bearing options and i think i want a pretty small one on this one so looks like oh boy it's hard to grab it uh, uh, there we go. Get one in the corner. Oh boy. All right, well that one's gone for a while. All right, so I think that one's gonna be our, our huckleberry there. Uh, I don't throw away much and uh, for good reason. Well, my wife doesn't think so, but uh, listen, this stuff comes in handy. 
So uh, let me measure this thing so we can figure out what uh, size drill bit to use and we'll drill a side hole. 145, almost 146. Well, I'm wiggling that thing around in there and I keep uh, clamping back down on it. And uh, you ever wonder how they get ball bearings so round? Uh, uh, pretty even all the way around. There's 145.9, 145.9, 145.7, 145.8. Wow, that's pretty impressive. All right, so uh, let me find a drill bit, uh, 146 or so, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll hog us a hole in there. There we go. Hole oh, looks bigger than it should be. Oh, where are you? All right, I'm gonna put this back in the lathe and clean up this burr. Let's see. Well, that's about right, I guess. Let me clean it up. All right, all drilled up here, and what I'm seeing is uh, this might be kind of the, the bottom end of uh, the diameter of pipe that you can actually bead this way. I know the professional kits that you buy when you get down to fairly small they kind of do it a different way it doesn't work quite as well as with these um, these ball bearing beaters so we might be at the bottom here and hopefully this one's going to work uh, I got some anti-seize on the bolt here the screw um, I had to drill down through into the other side to give enough clearance for the ball to go kind of deep in there and uh, it's still sticking out now I guess if I had a smaller ball bearing that would work but I'm not sure yeah we got a problem already so I don't know if I if I back the screw out far enough oh it's gonna work barely so I, like I said I think we're at the bottom end of this thing and in diameter of piping so I'm gonna put a little bit of luber plate in here to uh, just to kind of hold the the ball bearing in and lubricate things while we're working this metal. So I'm gonna turn the screw out until just about the time the ball bearing wants to drop. Let's give this a whirl. Uh, it won't go in there now. Let me back it out just a wee bit. Oh yeah. All right, so we've got it in. The ball's positioned right. We're gonna take a couple of rounds to start forming the metal. All right, and now we're going to tighten up just a wee bit. We'll take a couple more rounds. You can already see it starting to form the bead right here. Doesn't really matter which way you turn it. Getting a pretty good bead. So this is just kind of a judgment call here. What you feel comfortable with on the bead. I'm going to go a little bit more than that. You can feel it kind of tighten up when it when it starts really pushing on the metal. All right, I think that looks pretty good. Now we'll back the screw back out. Falls back in the hole and there it is.
All right, so that's what we're looking for. <laughs> that's the bead I like. Um, I don't know if I mean if you got if you got that tool, um, maybe this is this is good for you. But hey, this is what, <laughs> what I'm used to. I'm gonna I'm gonna use this, and uh, maybe when we get done forming this metal or this this tubing get it all into place when I got a little extra piece or when I make an oops and uh, I got a piece of scrap left over we'll run it in the uh, in the Eastwood machine and uh, this bigger bigger tubing this 5 16 uh, tubing to see what it looks like with this style and on the end of it you know I just noticed on this uh, tag nickel, nickel copper alloy easy bending never rust OEM specified I wonder what that means the OEM specified hmm if uh, if they're specifying it why aren't they using it on uh, OEM you know why isn't GM Ford Chrysler using this on uh, on their cars Hey, and one more little tidbit information. I, I've been using this bender for years, or or one like this for years, um, and it it works okay. It's it's never never great, um, but I was really having difficulty bending ninety degree bends uh, on the three sixteenths on the brake line, and uh, even as easy as this uh, nickel copper is to bend. Uh, it, it did okay. I was just worried about it kinking. I didn't wind up with any kinks, but it felt, uh, it felt like I was kind of pushing the limits on it. So I, uh, <laughs> I went to the Harbor Freight and, uh, and picked up this, uh, oh boy, um, bender here. And I practiced with it a little bit just with the, <laughs> you know, with the, the oops I made on this line, and it makes better bends. It's easier to manipulate this uh, this three sixteenths uh, around a ninety degree bend. Not quite ninety degrees there, but uh, it surely would have if I'd have pulled it around that far without any problem. So I was just thinking that the uh, you know the bigger the piping, the the harder it is to to go. Uh, to get it to bend like that. So uh, I'm going to give this thing a whirl and hopefully this is going to work better than the old uh, hand bender just because it's got uh, more of a mandrel uh, to keep things uh, from kinking. Hey guys, we're going to wrap this thing up. This video is way too long and just plain boring. So we're all done all the way up to the front. And just got to figure out how we're going to terminate things up there. Probably some kind of AN fitting, bulkhead fitting with, uh, with stainless steel flex lines. So thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed.